Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am here with Chris Adams of CCA Technology, and we're going to be talking about actually some things that have come up with some of my listeners um, that have been sending me questions about how to keep yourself safe online. You know, there's so many ways that people try to steal our identity or take things from us. And, you know, we have this intellectual property as musicians. And so I want to make sure, and, and of course, us as artists are like, you know, our brand is what is driving people to our music and to have that taken away can be a real setback. So we're going to talk about a lot of that today, um, but I'd love to get into a little bit about you, Chris. Let us know um, just a little bit about your background, how you got into working in IT and also about your musical background. Sure. Yeah. So um, I've always been musically inclined. I played the saxophone uh, growing up a lot. I was always kind of a short for my age. So I remember always uh, being like smaller than the instrument. That was always my thing. I remember, <laughs> uh, you know, I always thought it would be cool to play baritone sax or whatever, but you know, I was nine and just kind of a, a smaller, I hadn't hit my growth spurt yet. So uh, it was always funny to see pictures of me and there's just massive <laughs> saxophone. So that's kind of where musically I started was in the saxophone uh, ended up. Um, I think my mom sort of got me into it. She's like, Hey, I don't think there's a ton of bass players. So if you want to, you know, have an in at different places, you should play bass, learn how to do that. And, and you'll have an in. So I did that probably, you know, learned bass guitar and guitar probably 13, 14. And, uh, that was probably my main instrument, uh, for, for a long while. Um, never really was, I never really made, uh, any sort of career out of it, but we did play at Summerfest and we kind of, we were, we got, we got decently, uh, you know, well known in the area, um, back sort of in the, in the college days. And then, uh, everyone split, had to kind of go all different ways with work and family and things like that. So, uh, inevitably that, um, sort of ended, but kind of been playing on and off here and there, uh, church and things like that, uh, throughout the years. So, uh, musically, that's probably, uh, the history there. Uh, and then from technology perspective, I always, uh, was sort of natural there in kind of a similar way where, I didn't necessarily have to learn anything. It was just sort of God-given understanding. And that you, I'm sure you know those people in your life that uh, it just made sense, right? Like I could just take a computer apart and put it back together and figure things out. And uh, it didn't, I don't, just how my brain worked was kind of how mm. the computer works. So I didn't necessarily uh, have to put a lot of effort into it. And for me, that was good. I was just like, this seems easy, uh, you know, and uh, it just seems like a good, a good path. So I uh, went down the way of working for other people. And uh, I always was creative and how I wanted to do things and, um, and just even just customer service wise, how we wanted to treat people and, uh, and that sort of thing. And so I never really totally fell in, or at least that, that I could find uh, a company that really fit for me. Um, so I was like, ah, I'll just start my own, you know, I was young enough and I felt like it would be worth doing. So kind of went off on my own and, uh, been doing that ever since, uh, wife and three kids at home. And, um, yeah. Awesome. So the entrepreneur's path for the tech stuff. And do you mostly work with like local businesses in your area where you actually go out there and help them? Or are you working with a lot of people virtually? Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, we have, we have customers kind of all over the place. So we're definitely, we're definitely using that virtual thing a lot. Um, it was something we had in place before the pandemic. And then obviously mm -hmm. that, that escalated as uh, people wanted to work more from home. So a lot of our customers now um, have, you know, 250, 300 employees and they give them the freedom to work sort of anywhere. So um, there's, you know, we're not necessarily gonna drive all over the place, making sure people's, uh, you know, computers are set up the right way. So we can definitely do a lot of that remotely now and uh, more than we probably did two years ago even, so. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So what are the biggest things that you see, like kind of the biggest vulnerabilities that you see for, you know, individuals or companies that have a presence online nowadays? Sure. Yeah, honestly, I, I think I started thinking about this. I was on a WMV uh, Wisconsin Music Ventures podcast recently and kind of started thinking about those same sort of ideas of what would I uh, and lately it's been weird. I've almost been having to like, think like a hacker. So we're, mm. we're making a YouTube series kind of called that way, where it's just like, how do we think like what the hackers are going to do? How do you almost think about what would they do? Where are my weak points? How are they going to try to come after me? Uh, and so as I thought about that for musicians, I thought kind of that two things, the sort of intellectual property of it all. Um, and I don't necessarily claim to know all the legal ramifications of all that, but again, I think someone else talked about the, uh, some of those things on the WMV podcast, if you want to check that out. Um, but I, I think there's obviously a lot of work you want to do to make sure that all that intellectual property is in place, all those uh, copyrights or whatever you're going to do are in place before you start putting things online. Um, I think that's important to have all those. Again, I don't know what that process looks like, but there are people that, that could help with that, I'm sure. Uh, and you probably maybe even know more about that than someone else. So well, we've definitely um, had people on the show talking about that. We had a lawyer recently on here talking about that. So you guys can definitely reference that. Exactly. For or sure. That one out. Yeah. I think that's an important first step just to make sure that um, you're not just sort of willy nilly uh, putting things out there. Um, but then I think that the next thing for me, as I thought about musicians specifically, as I thought of impersonators, because I, mm -hmm. I feel like that's probably um, just when I see people have success uh, in that space where you, they, they're, you know, taking something of yours that you didn't want to let go of. It's almost always that case. And I think what happens is um, in the impersonator space, they, they get you to take your guard down. And as soon as that happens, you're more willing to, to do something, right? That you maybe didn't do before, right? You know, hey, you and I are having a meeting and I know it's coming up and somehow, you know, someone got into your email and knows what your schedule looks like and kind of what's coming up. And maybe, maybe we're not talking about a podcast, maybe we're talking about a contract. And so they get into your email, they send me something like, hey, Chris, here's the contract, we're going to review it in our next meeting. And, you know, make sure to click stuff. And then inside of that email or those attachments, there's, um, there's something bad that's, that's in those. Um, so I think it's just a matter of being really cautious. Um, and, you know, I would, I obviously know what your email is. So it's just a sense of like, is this actually from Brie? Is this her email? Or did someone just open, you know, a Gmail account quick. And so I think that's, I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing for me is a payment gateways. I, I think mm -hmm. as musicians get paid um, via different, you know, places they work or whatever, I imagine that's another area where I could see hackers trying to um, sort of weasel their way into, right? Of, um, I did a gig somewhere and um, I'm expecting to get paid. And all of a sudden now there's this, Hey, click this link and put your bank account information in so we can get the money to you. Right. Where again, if you have to think about these, it's a lot of social engineering or, you know, they hacked somebody and determined like, Hey, it looks like you're playing at a stage this weekend. And I can, you know, I've got, you know, my way into the people that are booking that, or I can make myself look like someone that's booking that from you. Uh, and then it, maybe they send you a link like, Hey, we're upgrading our, our payments for you because we want you to get paid faster and we don't want you to have to wait for a check or whatever your whatever the method is now. And you're like, oh yeah, that would be good. I would like to get paid now instead of, you know, in a month. Uh, and then you go to some link and you put in your bank account information and actually they, you know, they start taking money out of your account rather than putting it in your account. Um, so again, I think it's just those kind of thoughts, right? Is how do you, how do you sort of think like a hacker, right? Where would they, where do you just need to be a little more cautious when you are uh, living and working and breathing online is, um, I think, you know, in years past, we just had a general presumption that people were good and they wouldn't mm. necessarily do that unless, you know, there was a really one-off rare case. But, uh, I think sadly that's just become, uh, so commonplace now that, um, those things are, they're happening and it's not just in the large enterprise space. Cause I, I think that's kind of where it started, right? If it was, if we all had the idea like, no, they're never, they're never going to hack us that, you know, they're not going to do identity theft on me. I'm not worth anything. It doesn't really matter. Um, but that just hasn't proven to be true. Um, well, I think with the smaller ones, it's about volume for them, right? They yeah. can just like send out this stuff and a certain number of people are going to click. Right. And if they do a certain number of those and they get $500 from each person, right. You know, yep. if they do that a hundred thousand times, they get paid a right. lot of money. Yeah. Right. And you know, with, with computers, you can just 
deploy, a, you know, a million emails at once or yeah, whatever, exactly, right? And exactly. do that. Yep. And the hackers generally don't even deploy them themselves. So they'll find a way to hack into your computer and then they'll get your contact list and they'll send it out from your computer as you. And so, you know, they'll get 10,000 emails out because you know a lot of people and it doesn't really affect them at all. And if those people click or pay or whatever, um, they get money. And if, you know, if eventually you find out that this is on your computer and you delete it, it's, it doesn't cost them anything. They didn't, you know, didn't even have to own a computer. Um, so. So what are the common ways that they're getting in? How do they get into your computer to be able to access your email like that? Yeah, you know, the statistics are really, really high. It's almost all email. Really? Um, yeah, cybersecurity, if you look at the sort of, um, when, we're, when we're training um, companies and things like that from an employee perspective, um, it, the statistics are like 86% that those initial hacks come in via some sort of an email. Um, and so that's why it's just so important to be like extra cautious, everything you do, whenever you're, you know, signing a contract, opening an attack, you know, just to spend that extra little bit of time to make sure, you know, Hey, I, I know Bree's email because we've been emailing back and forth. Is this her or is this, you know, Bree eight, six, five, three, two, one, zero at right. gmail.com. That costs no one anything, right? They can go to Gmail. <clears throat> if they know your name, they can put Bree Noble and, and Google will, you know, give them some sort of randomly generated email. They can click next, next, finish. And if they have your contact list, now they can start emailing people, you know, without too much consequence. Um, so yeah, I think it's just, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So basically they could send, they could send my contacts something that then if they clicked on it, it would, it would get on their computer. Is that how it right. works? Exactly. Okay. And it would do anything. And again, I think because, um, because of our trust in people, um, if they can send an email that looks like it's coming from you, they're much more likely to not think about it, right? Oh, it's from Bree. And immediately yeah. you're thinking, oh, it's from Bree. So you, you stop being cautious. You stop, you know, thinking like, oh, Bree's not going to try to steal my money. Right. So I think some of that, some of that defense shield comes down typically if they can impersonate someone else. Um, and so you start maybe clicking on things or opening attachments or doing things you would normally just not do. If it was from a random person, you wouldn't, give them your bank account information or ask, you know, put in a password or something else. But if it came from someone you knew and they're getting good because they'll generally hack someone else first, kind of figure out what that person would expect to come from them. Mm. And then that email looks very convincingly like I'm expecting a contract from a customer that should be here in the next week or two. And boom, they drop one in in advance of when that customer actually gave it to you. And it's very convincing. Um, wow. Yeah. That yeah. that's, it's, it's almost pretty hard to spot. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I would think if you're, if you're working out a payment situation with someone, I would think at least making sure upfront when you're discussing, like you're going to do the gig and here's the deal, making sure you understand how they're going to pay you. So there's not this like later on something sends you a thing that says, Oh, we need your bank information. You'd be like, right. no, we already talked about the fact that you were going to pay me by PayPal or you were going to pay me by check or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And if that payment gateway email thing they send you isn't what was in the contract, then mm -hmm. yeah, then I would call and ask questions. I think that's another thing is feel free to call people. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I feel like um, those kind of things aren't difficult to just call up the person, the main contact person and be like, hey, I just want to clarify. I got this email. It looks like I'm supposed to get paid. I like this. I like this idea, but is this from you? Right. Oh yeah, that's from us. Okay, cool. Right. Or even their email. If you know for sure what their e actual real email is, probably not as good as calling them, but um, just to email their, you know, full email, not a Gmail account, not something else. That's probably, um, you know, say, Hey, I got this. I just want to confirm that this is, this is true. Um, because we've gotten things from our customers that are so close that it's hard to tell for sure. And I'm just like, this looks legitimate, but mm -hmm. I would still call your customer because I don't want you going online and putting, you know, like, I don't know that I would want to put my reputation on that. So I think some of those times it's just good to, to double check, but especially that email, know who you're getting emails from and communicating with. Uh, and just, it's, it's just a couple extra seconds because a lot of times when you get email, it just shows the display name and the email, you tend to ignore that. And I just, um, I think if we kept an eye on that, um, you'd be surprised about how few, uh, issues you'd actually run into. Yeah. And I think too, with payment gateways, like I've gotten one that looked like it was from PayPal, but it wasn't, yeah. it was like, right. you know, PayPal payments at gmail.com or something like that. Right. Yep. Yeah, if right. you hover over those, if you hover over those links where it's just like, it might say PayPal, it might be a PayPal button, but if you hover mm -hmm. your mouse over there, it's like, yeah, payments.gateway.com slash some random number. You're like, that doesn't, 
that doesn't look like PayPal. That's just something um, that's not good. So. Yep. Definitely. Just, just always check that. Um, yeah. So what about with social media, like a similar thing, right? People can take over your friends, social media, and then they've got like a picture that looks like them. So it right. looks like they're, you know, contacting you and they're, you're actually your friend. And then, you know, what is it they're trying to do with that? Yeah. Again, they're, I think they're just trying to get anything. So um, I think any information becomes valuable, right? Which is why all these tech companies are worth money. No, you know, these tech companies have no actual assets, but they're worth $42 billion, right? Like mm -hmm. they don't sell anything. They don't do anything, but the, the data is valuable because you can, you can market to them. You can, whatever, I mean, what, whatever they can, they can use data for anything. They can sell it. If they get your password, they can sell it on the dark web. Uh, I think they're just mining for anything and whatever they'll use, they just turn around and leverage that to the highest capacity they can. So, um, you know, if they get your contact list and nothing else, then they'll email your contact list. But then you look kind of weird because it's just like all your contact got an email that look like it was from you saying, give me some money or mm -hmm. can you buy me a Walmart gift card for 500 bucks or something. <laughs> and, you know, then, then you look weird, right? You're just like, oh, it just looks like I wasn't securing my own, uh, you know, email account and passwords and things that well. Um, so, but yeah, other than that, I don't know. I think, I, I think they're just looking for money. And like you said, I think it's the scale. Mm -hmm. um, if you get 10 bucks, a hundred thousand times, I mean, that's a million dollars. So, right. That's true. Um, is, is there any kind of, cause I've definitely gotten these like DMS on Facebook or something where someone created a duplicate account of one of my friends. Okay. Is there any like telltale sign that it's not them? I know sometimes we just get a friend request from someone and we're like, I know I'm already friends with them. Right. So that's when you look into it. Yeah. In those regards, I would look at, I would look at grammar, spelling, Mm. Um, generally that generally they're not always primarily English speaking. So they're, they like, even, even just like cultural lingo might not be as quite as natural. And so, um, if you look back a lot of those times, you'd be like, oh yeah, if I was paying a little more attention, that is a weird way to say that or, mm. or something. Um, and it's, it's noticeable if you take a little bit of extra time with it. Um, but yeah, again, if someone asked you to be a friend on Facebook, I don't, they don't have necessarily have much at that point, right? They'd have to get you to do something else. Um, maybe they get your friends. Right. I, I know, I think in the early days of Facebook, right? I would basically accept most friend requests yeah. that people sent me because I was like, oh, I want to build up my fan base, right? right? But nowadays, I really don't accept friend requests unless I know them or I know someone who knows them. We have mutual friends. I can look into them. Are they a musician? You know, do you recommend not accepting friend requests from people that you don't know? At this point, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, or, or just be specific, just be a little bit, you know, if you had a, if you had a fan page that was just not your personal, it was just about music and there was almost no information about you, your family, your friends, your address, no, no pictures of your house. You know, if there's no, personal information ever on that. I don't know that there would be necessarily an issue with that. If it's just like, you know, I'm sure, you know, Dave Matthews probably has a Facebook page that someone manages for them. Right. And they mm -hmm. just auto accept anyone that that's going to follow the page, but it's not, you know, there's never going to be like, Hey, Dave Matthews is back home or he just got in his plane. And, you know, there's not going to, there's not going to be any sort of uh, link to any sort of data that would be valuable for them to, to glean from that account. So um, from like a business perspective, I think that would be okay. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I just, I think with Facebook, it's like you put a lot of more personal stuff on your personal profile. And so if you're accepting right. people as friends, they're going to yeah. know your date of birth, you know, yeah. cause Facebook publicizes exactly. that. Yeah. It's, there's too much information in Facebook sometimes. And you don't think about it because you're just like, Oh, again, your guard is down. These are my friends. I know them, mm -hmm. you know, Hey, we're moving. Hey, we're doing this. Here's your, here's our new address. And then again, now they've got your birthday. Now they've got your address. Yeah. The, the, there's an, there's a chance they get too much information there. And then maybe they don't even do anything with that, but it's a jumping point, right. To be like, okay, now I have these couple of things. Maybe I, all I need now is to go find a password on the dark web somewhere uh, right. for an account. And then I have this, you know, what's the last, you know, what's the month and day you were born. I, I don't That mm -hmm. would be a weird security question, but you never know. Right. Yeah. I think what's it's just your maiden that. name because that's yeah, sometimes right. on Facebook. Right. So I think they just build a profile on you. Right. And then when they have enough information, they'll leverage it to you know, wow. Whatever. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, speaking of passwords, I would love to know, like, what do you think the best way is to manage passwords? Do you recommend using things like LastPass and stuff yeah. since we just have so many of them? Yep, for sure. 
Yeah, it's way better to have a really complex password that doesn't change than to have them written down everywhere or have all the same password. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would also implement multi-factor authentication. So, you know, if you use multi, if you use LastPass or Google or any one of those single sign-on platforms, um, if someone wanted to get in to get those passwords, obviously there's a password to get into that password. Um, but there's also going to be a multi-factor authentication step, right? Where they're going to make you go on your phone and type a code in and type it in somewhere else. And um, there would be an extra layer that they'd have to have stolen some other information from you before they could get into all those accounts. Um, but yeah, I think those are, those are um, much better ways of doing your passwords. Um, I know Google uh, does it and they, they'll actually check the dark web for you. So if any of your passwords ah. have been breached, they'll tell you. I think LastPass does the same thing, but uh, any of those are great. LastPass costs money depending on how you use it and how many accounts you have and things like that. Um, right. Yeah. I think it's version. free. Like at first, if it's just you, but like if you have a team or you need to share your passwords with people, which I do, right. then I pay for it. Exactly. Right. And you know, it's probably worth it for that, that added Definitely. security benefit. And um, so we use these, those kind of things at, at our office as well. Um, just because then you can control passwords, where they go, who changed it, when does it change? Um, and then it can always stay hidden. So you can just copy and paste it and you don't have to necessarily do whatever if you need to put it somewhere else. Um, and it'll help you reset passwords when you need to pick one. You just like have the tool uh, create right. a really complex password for you. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, chickens 2021. <laughs> yeah. Something else that's interesting about passwords um, that was actually sort of news to me recently is uh, you can type really long actual words in a sentence. And those passwords are as good as, you know, if you type something, let's say you got something to 20, 25 characters, right? Like my dog really likes to sleep under the back porch, right? Like that password is really long, but you were, it's easy to remember. You don't have to, you don't have to write it down anywhere. Um, that password, there's things you can check online to see what you can go online and Google like password checker. It'll tell you how bad your password is. Mm. Um, something like that with that many characters will be like 20 billion years to crack the password. Um, and so it's funny, sometimes it's almost about the length of the password and not necessarily the complexity of it. That makes sense. Instead of having to put capitals and, you know, yep, characters right. and all that yep. stuff in there, just make it long, but something right. and, you could remember. And even some of the password <clears throat> generators now, I think LastPass has an online generator. And a lot of times they'll do that for passwords where it's like, you know, chicken dash, you know, house dash, whatever, It'll oh my three or four different words um, that aren't super long or hard to remember. And that will be a in their mind, strong password. So interesting. Yeah. I think sometimes we think our password has to be like, you know, exclamation point at dollar sign Q, right. w, you know, capital W, capital J. Um, and, and no one would ever memorize it ever because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it can be, there's ways to do it where even to get into those uh, like last pass and things like yes. that to make those passwords um, something you, if you had to log into them, um, you can make them just sort of long sentences. It could even um, be like the lyric, you know, the first line of yeah. lyrics to your song or something. Yeah. But there's a tool online to go check that. I, I've never felt good about giving them my actual password, but what I'll do is kind of do something near it, right? Where I'm just mm -hmm. like, oh, I'll, I'll put in the amount of characters or the amount of words. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's kind of a fun tool to, to see how good your password is or change a couple of things in your password, but like keep the length and sort of the same complexity and it will give you an idea. Uh, we've sat down with some customers and shown them that and they're like, oh, it would take them 10 days to crack my password. Yeah, yeah, 10 days. Mm -hmm. Some of them are minutes or less than minutes. Some of them are just zero seconds. Oh. If your password is like password or God or, well, yeah, you know, nothing. Um, uh, it's, it's funny. So yeah, some good tools that are free. That you Makes can sense not to put the actual password in there because someone could create that just to steal people's passwords. <laughs> I, yeah, I just, I just don't know that I trust those websites well enough. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a great tool to get really close to type your password, nearly your password in there. Uh, mm -hmm. and be like, oh, wow, that's, you know, I think my main password's like a thousand years or something like that, which is a long time, but you mm -hmm. know, you're still that's like, ah, oh, that's, you know, it's not great. Actually, you'd be surprised. Cause you like, you add a couple of characters and it's like 400,000 years. Oh my know? gosh. Wow. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Yep. So what about like their website? You know, I know people can yep. get their websites hacked and stuff like yep. that. What is the best way to secure your website? I would say keep up with it. Um, I would imagine that most of them are probably in WordPress. Um, if you're in something like Wix, you probably get updates and that sort of thing automatically. Um, a, a lot of our people use Banzoogle and I'm sure that they are, you know, getting Banzoogle is on top of things, but yeah, a lot of people do use WordPress. Okay. Um, do you, when you log into that, is there like a back end to that? Uh, Banzoogle? Yes. 
Okay. It's basically, it- it's a platform with templates and stuff. Okay. Um, in that case, they probably, their, their monthly fee is probably higher for that, right? And so they, they probably, have you seen people there get hacked on that platform? I haven't heard a lot about that. I hear more about WordPress getting hacked, yeah. honestly. Yeah, for sure. I would imagine that if you're with a Wix or something like that, um, because I would imagine they're at least somewhat custom enough that the attack surface is really low. Um, and so WordPress gets attacked a lot because there's, it's probably billions by now, right? In, in the multiples um, of people that use WordPress. So if there's billions of websites out there, it's worth going after them, right? Because all you gotta do is find you know, 100,000 of those that haven't done updates ever, they've got plugins. Um, so if you're on WordPress, I think the things I would say um, don't have leftover themes um, because inevitably when, you, when you're installing WordPress, a lot of times it'll like toss a whole bunch of themes in WordPress. Uh, mm-hmm. Once you've figured out which one you're going to use and you build your website out, get rid of all the rest of them. Um, they don't do. Oh, any I good. never they're, thought about that. They're free. You can go get them later. So they don't. They don't do you any good sitting there, and they're actually kind of a target because all those folders exist in your network. Go in there, oh. get rid of those uh, plugins. I would get rid of any plugins you don't use. Again, there's just, you know, every plugin is a is an attack surface theoretically on your network. I would get rid of them. It also can make your website a little slower, um, but uh, get rid of those. And then the third thing is make sure to stay up on updates. Um, so WordPress itself will get updates and all the plugins will get updates as well. Um, a lot of times, um, those updates, if you're using like a web builder or some of those things, if you use like the premium web web builder, it's, you know, $20 a year or something to stay up on support. I'd recommend doing that. Uh, you're running a business. It's, it shouldn't, you know, $20 a month or not a $20 a month, $20 a year isn't the end of the world. Uh, but if you don't do that, you can't get the updates. Um, and so if there is hey, you know, WP Bakery Builder, the premium one, you know, version 2096 has issues, right? If mm-hmm. you keep running 2096 for the rest of your life because you don't want to pay 20 bucks a year, um, your website's at risk as soon as someone finds out that you're running that. Mm. Um, and so, you know, these, these hacks get published as soon as someone finds a website that's running it, then it's just like free game. We know that we can do a buffer overflow on whatever website and get what we want, so... Yeah. And I mean, even having somebody monitoring that I have a service that monitors it every month and it's crazy. I get a report and for one of my sites, I'm like, it says like, you know, multiple lockouts have occurred this month, which basically means people tried to get into my site that weren't supposed to get in there. Right. Right. And I'm like, how, why, why is this happening? You know, and I don't really know why, but I'm just so glad that they're like, you know, they're making sure they're not getting in and they're, and they're letting me know that. Yep. Yeah. And you can pay, that's probably a premium service to be on that then. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know like I'm trying to think of a couple of places we use like dream dream uh, as a dream weaver dream host, I think has like a dream mm-hmm. press um, upgrade. Yeah. A lot of them have now sort of like a managed WordPress and they, they tend to do some of that stuff for you. Um, right. Yeah. And so what about, what about, what about, uh, SSL certificates. Should we yeah, always that's, that's have those? Too. Those are free. Okay. So they're free or they should be free nowadays. Most mm-hmm. of the most, if you're hosting your website somewhere, usually it'll be included with your right. Hosting. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Especially if you're doing any kind of payment, um, I'd have SSL in there for sure. Even if it's just a link to some other payment gateway, I would, I would have it. Honestly, now Chrome has gotten angry at sites that aren't SSL encrypted. So, um, it's probably a good idea just to, even if it's just informational to have it. Yeah. Makes sense. What yeah. about, um, cause I know, especially musicians, they tend to buy their domain, which is good to, to preserve it. Like if they come up with a band name or what, but then they are not using it. Does is that leaving us open? Could someone realize, oh, this domain is, you know, not being used right now and try to hack it more likely. Mm-hmm. No. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. So if you, if you bought a domain, say from GoDaddy and then you went right. there, It'll say like this site's under construction. Like, right. look forward to whatever. They park it. They, I think used to back in the day, you used to have to go into one of these websites and park it yourself. Mm-hmm. But I think they've gotten smarter and realized that hey, not every single one of us is a web designer, and so they'll check it. And if you haven't put something there uh, for your website yet, they'll just they'll put something up for you that says hey, this website's under construction. There's a new domain. Look for some changes <laughs> here and coming in the next months or whatever. Um, and so that it looks like you're you're building something. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't think there's, no one could steal it. I think the, the worst part would be letting it expire. And then mm-hmm. someone starts putting things on there, right? Like, hey, we started this band name, you know? Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden someone buys your domain when, when it expires. Okay. Well, it's good to know. 
I wasn't sure because I mean it does it does it is clear that there's nothing there yet, but like you said, it says under construction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not like there's a security risk. They can't, you know, they can't log in um, and do anything. I think WordPress used to do that where, um, and it depends, I haven't done a brand new WordPress install uh, in a little while now, but um, I think WordPress used to just let you, if you install a brand new WordPress site, you would sort of set up WordPress for the first time by like kind of walking through some initial steps where you'd pick an account and a password. Um, and so if you do start building a website, make sure to finish it, I guess. So if you start going through that process, sometimes there'll be like a you know, token or an email they'll send you to kind of finish setting up the website. Uh, make sure that that gets done pretty quickly, that there's not sort of an open door for someone to go make accounts while it's in setup mode. Right. Um, so is there anything else that we haven't talked about, especially in relation to like just making sure that, you know, who you are online is protected? Because as artists, you know, our brand, who we are is the most important thing, really, that's helping people find our music. And if someone else takes that over, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I honestly couldn't think of it. I, I think because it changes so much, I honestly think that's that's what people need to do. They just need to be a, a lot more cautious than they they were. I think uh, on the last music podcast, it was kind of the same idea of it was kind of like, hey, don't just go chucking your music online. Go make sure they're like copyrighted. Like there's just there's some work to do. Just make sure that you're being a little methodical about how you act, work, whatever. Uh, and I honestly felt like when we were kind of going back and forth it felt like the technology side of it really kind of coincided a lot with just other things you're going to have to do to start a business. Like, Hey, this is a business. It's not just like, Hey, I just want to, you know, go play at, you know, the, the farmer's market on Saturday. Well, you know, if you're, if you're going to start a business and you're going to, you're going to pursue that sort of thing, just take it a little bit seriously, I guess. Right. And so I think when you're getting emails and getting payments that you're just like, you employ some of that sort of like caution as you're going through, like, what, what is the next step? Should I be clicking on this? Is this who I think it is? Uh, and I think honestly, a little bit of pause would resolve a, a huge amount of it. Do you think also it's good to, to really keep your personal separate from your business? So like, should you have, if you have like a website, brienoble.com, you know, should I have all of my emails for my music coming from brienoble.com and that kind of thing? Does that help protect you? Um, I think I would separate the business from the personal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times your brand probably is you, right? Um, yes. So our company, you know, the brand is me, right? We have employees and they're awesome and they do 98% of the work. They're awesome, fantastic people. I think the issue is the brand was me, right? So instead of, you know, a lot of the things aren't like, hey, go check out our company. It's more like, hey, let's, here's a new tech thing from Chris Adams, just because right. there's something personal about that. People know who I am. And, um, and so I, I do think there is, there is a lot of brand that happens just based on the person. Um, but then I, that, that's just the, the cost of doing business. Like my personal, I, I nothing about me is on the internet, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't like, Hey, I'm going on doing this thing. Cause I know there's that risk. Right. So my LinkedIn and my Facebook and stuff, it's, it's work, it's work related stuff, because I know there's that weird mix of like, yeah, my brand kind of is who I am. Um, so I, I just don't, I don't know that I, uh, you know, post pictures of my baby and stuff on Facebook. And like, just because that tends to be where people follow us for work and for technology advice and things like that. Um, so, it's such again, a hard line to walk because as yeah. artists, we do want to, you know, we want to, ident we want people to identify with us as people. Right. And as, yeah. you know, as me, for me, like a mom, like I do post pictures of me with my daughters and, you know, right. and my husband and, you know, we went on vacation and that kind of thing. And I do think that that is important I think what I was thinking of is like, as far as email, you know, when you're dealing with um, any online things or your, your booking and that kind of thing, having a separate email where all of that takes place. So in case that does get hacked in some way, it's also not act hacking your whole personal life. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you could always create, you know, you could always create Bree, you know, Bree Noble music profile. Right. Like, you know, you could create things that are still your brand that are just a different name that maybe you're a little more free on who gets to join those right because you're like yeah maybe someone saw a show and wants to see what my new, new new music is but you don't necessarily want them following you to see what your vacations are and things like that right um so and I, I have a couple of those things too where there's like some corporate things and then i've got a personal facebook page that not everyone would necessarily know where it is or you know how to get there um, right 
Yeah. Yeah. You just have to figure out what you're comfortable with for sure. Yeah. But I think that keeping, especially just like email, a separate email yeah. that is just for your music stuff, I think is really important because then if either one of them gets hacked, it's not going to, if your personal gets hacked somehow, it's not going to, they're not going to be going after your business contacts and vice versa. And I honestly think it looks way more professional. We have some clients mm -hmm. that are three or $4 million a year, but they don't, they have Gmail accounts or they have, you know, something else like a roadrunner accounts or whatever the old charter spectrum. You, <laughs> oh you know, my gosh. And you're, yeah. And it's just, you look or at it AOL like, oh, or Yahoo. Yeah, yeah. AOL. Um, and you're just, it's so surprising because you're like, you are running a legitimate business. And I, I think it says something about who you are. Right. So um, it's just so much more professional to have the at, you know, breednoblemusic.com or something like just, and it's not difficult to do anymore. You know, if you get some of those right. online builder things that are all inclusive, if you got to do Gmail, that's great. Um, well, but, and you can use G Suite. So if you use G yes, Suite, you get right. all the Gmail stuff, but you can, I mean, we have that and it's, you know, yep. Bree at femusician.com, exactly. but it's still using all the Google tools. Right. And it's not and expensive. Just, yeah, exactly. It's not expensive. It's super easy mm -hmm. to set up. And you just, you, you went from like getting a Gmail account that costs you nothing to like, it's just like a whole nother tier for not that much money. You just look so much more it's professional. It's like $6 like, dollars per person yeah. or something. Yeah. Right. It's really exactly. cheap. Exactly. But, it, but you just, I, I think you just look way more serious, right? You're just like, I'm, I'm, I'm in this to be in business. I'm going to take this seriously. Um, and so I'm going to put the things in place, you know, that, that make me look serious. Um, and there's a website and it has information about me. And um, when, when I sit down with those kind of customers and people, and, you know, you see those bands that are just like, they have really professional things and they're just doing everything well. You're just, your initial reaction of them is just higher, right? You're like, yeah, wow. Like they're really on top of things. Um, and so even when you're booking things, I would imagine that makes a huge difference for people that are just like, I'm going to book someone. I would imagine that you're going to be like, this person has their own domain, their website, their email, all that stuff. You're probably going to look way more serious. They're going to yep. show up on time They're, You know, you just have a, initially before anything's happened, you have that initial, uh, in, you obviously not that there's judgment in it, but there's that initial, like, oh yeah. Okay. I just, I, I don't have to worry as much about maybe like some things that I would maybe have to worry oh, about. Oh yeah. First case. impressions are big yeah. and Huge. your email is oftentimes the first impression, right? Right. Yep. Or your website. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And I think nowadays with all the tools that are out there, there's no, there's almost no cost to entry anymore. Yeah. Uh, you guys are so lucky. Like, I feel like I started back in the stone age when everything was more expensive and you had to like it, custom it, build your website yeah, and all you, that. It costs you $5,000 to get a really generic website up with a couple pages. And totally. Yeah. Now you can pay 10 bucks a month for Wix and they'll like build it for you in five minutes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I know. Or Banzoogle where it's all organized just for musicians and they've got all the tools that you need and you can do paywalls and all this stuff and it's all yep. included. You know, you don't have right. to build all this stuff out right. yep. and credit card. I mean, remember back in the day when you had to like set up a merchant account and it was all like really expensive and, and, then, yeah, you have now to, we and can... then you have to deal with PCI compliance because it's now on you because you're actually putting an SSL page on your website and it's not going to some third party gateway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now we just have it all built in if you use Banzoogle and then, you know, you don't have to deal with any of the merchant accounts and the banks and all that stuff. I feel like We're you should get lucky. some sponsorships from them. I feel like we've said Banzoogle. Right. At least we've said Banzoogle. Times. Well, I do. I do. I do uh, promote them because I love them, but yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. Give, give them a call. I feel like if you talk about them this much on other podcasts and things like that, they, they owe you a oh. free account or like, like a, like a customer code at the bottom, like 10% Absolutely. No, code. we do. We have a, well, I'll just mention it right now. WOS 15. You guys can get a uh, free 30 day trial and 15% off with Banzoogle. So, there because go, I do, I do think it is such a great option for musicians because you don't have to worry about a lot of this stuff. Their yeah. platform is protecting you versus WordPress where people can, you know, right. kind of sneak in the back door. Yeah. And I'm sure it costs you a little bit of money, but then there's the lack of headache, right? Which and the support is probably worth it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The support if something goes wrong. Okay. Yeah. Well, is there anything else we didn't cover or do you feel like we've covered most of what musicians need to know when working I online? I don't think so. I think that's awesome. I think we got the accidentally, we got the product placement in there. So I think, <laughs> I, th I think that wraps it up. That's pretty good. <laughs> I think so. Well, thank you so much. This has been great. Yeah. I know it's going to be really helpful for people, you know, whatever stage of business you're in, if you've done some of this stuff and you're like, shoot, I've done this wrong or I'm vulnerable or whatever, just go and fix it. Like, don't, yeah. don't worry. We've all done things that, 
you know, we've all put ourselves out there in ways that maybe we're, we're not the best at first, but we just go back and fix it. And if you're new, yep. then you're going to be able to fix this all up from the beginning. For sure. Yeah. And I, the, you know, the musician isn't really our target demographic, but I love helping people. So if, if anyone out there ever has questions, comments, you know, and they wanted just a quick, like, Hey, I have this question. You think I should do this? We could be like, no. <laughs> so if there's ever things like that, that you hear from people that are just looking for um, you know, a quick advice or something. It could absolutely. So let them know where can they find you online. Uh, I would have them go through you because if they try to get a hold of me, I'm hard to get a hold of. Otherwise, uh, I I think if they just call their office, they wouldn't get anywhere. Um, ah, okay. We get, well, we get way too we get way too many spam calls. So like the script mm. to like determine whether or not the person calling is actually someone we know is uh, is kind of difficult. Um, Perfect. Okay. Well, you guys, you can email me at Brie at femusician.com. If you want to get in touch with Chris, are you on socials anywhere where they can follow you? You mentioned that you do. do, Yeah. CCA CCA technologies out there on LinkedIn and Facebook and things like that. So they can got it. CCA technology. Yeah. So check that out. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been awesome. Thanks for listening to the profitable musician show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.